Hi, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson, and I am so thrilled to be with my friend David Burkus to celebrate the launch of his latest book, Friend of a Friend, which I'm so happy to have in the office. I actually got to go to our local Barnes & Noble store to pick up this book. It was on a display, so if you're a bookstore junkie, you could perhaps go out today and look for it as well. Uh, David is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I am in my hometown of Lambertville, Michigan, and we're thrilled that you've decided to join us today. So as we're getting started, I hope you'll take a moment to become familiar with the question panel, and perhaps you can tell us where you're calling from. It looks like someone already has Hi in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you happen to be participating in this training today with part of a group um, in your organization, would you just take a quick moment to let us know the name of that organization? We always love to give a shout out to the people who are uh, joining together to learn from the amazing experts who participate in our Weaving Influence webinars. So uh, thanks to many of you who are letting us know where you're from. Um, and it looks like there's a company called Shink. Um, and another company, let's see, I don't know, these are coming fast and furious, Guardian Ad Lightum Program in Tampa, Florida, Chick-fil-A in Moline, Illinois. Uh, so thank you to many of you who are joining. A few housekeeping notes as we get started today. Uh, David and I are going to have a, a scheduled conversation with some uh, questions that highlight the content of his latest book. And then toward the end of this hour, we will be opening up for your questions. So you can feel free to put those questions into the question panel at any time. Uh, welcome to the team at Walgreens, by the way. Um, and we'll be happy to get to those questions at the end. Uh, we are recording today's event and we would welcome you to share this recording with others. Uh, also, we will have a PDF of the slides with our follow-up materials, along with some very special bonuses if you buy David's book this week. Um, so please stay tuned all the way through the end to find out about the bonuses. And uh, we'll be thrilled also to share those with you via email. If you happen to be a big fan of Twitter and want to share your thoughts during today's event, you can feel free to use, use the hashtag friend of a friend, uh, just like the book title. And we'll be happy after uh, the event to catch up with you on that hashtag over on Twitter. So let me take a quick moment to introduce you, David, and I'm going to watch you and hopefully we won't step on each other. So David has been a friend of mine since 2009. We met through the leadership blogging community and in, in the year since then, he's written three best-selling books, uh, The Myths of Creativity, Under New Management, and Friend of a Friend, his latest book. He is an associate professor of leadership and innovation at Oral Roberts University, a husband and a dad of two amazing sons. And his TED Talk has been viewed over 1.8 million times. We should probably include a link to that TED Talk in our follow-up email. Um, let's do a quick test. David, are you hearing me? I am hearing you. I'm seeing a bit of a delay on your camera, but I'm definitely hearing you fine. Okay, well, um, let's try to do the best we can on this. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask Aubrey to uh, send a tweet to go to webinar and see if we can get some help. Uh, this is an unfortunate technology glitch that we're not loving today. Um, but let's dive in. We want to talk about some questions related to your new book, Friend of a Friend. And uh, David, what I've heard you say is that this book is not just about networking, but about how networks actually work. So why is it so important for us to understand that? Yeah, I think fundamentally, um, one of the one of the biggest problems that we have is when we think networking for a lot of people is like a four letter word. Right. They feel dirty. They feel awkward. They feel you know, like they inauthentic, et cetera. And I think the primary reason for that is that somewhere along the line, we lost the point. Somewhere along the line, a lot of people thought that networking meant adding a bunch of new connections to your your contacts app on your phone, your LinkedIn connections, et cetera. And then as a result, suddenly all of the networking advice books and all the literature was about how to introduce yourself, how to work things that fundamentally like we don't want to do. Same time, like we're neglecting a lot of the most powerful things about um, community and about people, which is the network that you're already in. So the, the best way that I've learned to say it is that you cannot build your network. You can't grow your network. You don't have a network. You exist inside of a network. And the best strategy you can have for your career, for your organization, for your life is to understand the network that you're in, how it operates, and then respond accordingly. Uh, that makes sense. So um, can you tell me what you mean by find strength in weak ties? 
Yeah, so this is this is one of the first kind of insights that you we come across when you study the network that you're in instead of just trying to run up the contacts on your LinkedIn, et cetera. And that is that some of the most powerful connections that you have in terms of new information, new introductions, um, new, new sources of ideas are not your close contacts and they're not the total strangers that you think you're supposed to go to that networking mixer to meet. They are what we call your weak ties and your dormant ties. Weak ties are people that you you know, but you don't know that well. So like you, maybe you work together, but you only see each other when there's cake in the break room, or maybe you know them because you see them at the gym and you might know their name and their job, but you don't see each other that often. Those are weak ties. And then dormant ties are a little bit different. They're a form of a weak tie that used to be stronger, but for some reason or other, they fell by the wayside. And if you think about everybody you know, most of us, and Aubrey, you can click to sort of the next slide. Most of us, when we think about our network, we think about the cluster that's closest to us, right? So these are the people we know, these are the five people we talk with most to use the Jim Rohn line, et cetera. The problem is if you look at this diagram, it's a lot, it's representative of what a lot of us have with our close connections, which is most of them are connected to each other. A few of them might not be. But over time, since they're kind of together, they have access to the same information, they know the same people, they talk to the same people. Uh, they're, the sociologist Ronald Burt uses the term redundant. They're redundant in terms of new information, new ideas. We click to the next one, let me show you what's, what weak and, and uh, dormant ties are. So weak ties and dormant ties occupy a different space. They're a part of a different cluster because they, they have their own close-knit connections, but they're not you. And so they become a bridge to those other communities for you and become a potent source of new ideas, new information, et cetera. Now, in, in some of the networking advice books in the past, you'll hear people talk about weak ties, but it's usually to the point of, oh, well, when you get laid off or if you're looking for a new job or whatever, reach back out to your weak ties. It's too late then. It, it, it's important to be engaging in a regular system of engaging with those weak and dormant ties, checking in with them often so that... Uh, when it comes time where you need to help them or they need to help you, it's just one more in a series of conversations. Well, so can we talk about that for a minute, David? Because my assumption... By the way, you're live again, so that's good. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, someone on the chat told us that we're back in sync now. I'm so glad. Um, so thinking about weak ties, you know I'm a marketer and we do social media on behalf of our clients. So when I would give advice to someone, I would say, you know, it's important to show up on social media, like in a way that's that's a means of staying connected to your weak ties. If you're sharing content of value, you can become memorable to them because they see you. So is that enough in terms of staying in connection with our dormant or weak ties? Or are you talking about fundamentally some different way of regularly connecting with folks? So I would say it depends on how you're using it, right? So most of us, if you're just getting involved in social media and then you're just broadcasting what you're up to and praying that people are watching, first of all, it's not gonna work. The algorithms don't work that way. Um, but second of all, that that's sort of not um, the entire story. What I coach a lot of people to do, so there, there are software and technologies you can use. I use one called Contactually that I love that keep track of how often you're talking to people and will ping you if you let a relationship go too long without conversing with them. That most people don't need that level of a software where social media really comes into play. Uh, before before the number one complaint was privacy, you know, a couple weeks ago, the number one complaint about most of social media was like, oh, it's like drinking from a fire hose. My newsfeed is full. Well, your, your newsfeed is full of information that your weak and dormant ties are putting out there, right? And you might say, well, I just want to scroll through this and get at the close contacts, but don't neglect the opportunity to take the information that they're broadcasting and then do something with it to engage a conversation. I believe you've got to engage a deeper conversation than just clicking like or commenting on that post. I think you take the information that they're broadcasting and then you go to a deeper medium, an email, a text message, a phone call, but you use that information as the bridging off point, the excuse to have a deeper conversation. And I don't think you have to do it all that often. I mean, do one person a week uh, is more than enough time. And really, we're, we're not talking about a huge investment of time. Well, you're already scrolling mindlessly through your news feed anyway. Most of us are. I do it a couple times a day. Take the 30 seconds it takes to then send that more personal email. Make it a habit of doing that, and you'll be constantly checking back out with those weak ties. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, Riley is asking if you would repeat the name of that software that you use. Uh, it's Contactually. So contact actually like that. Um, you, you have, I, I, uh, I, I talk, I don't talk about him in the book. Actually, I should have given away, uh, I'll talk him into giving away a free trial as one of the pre-order bonuses actually, cause I know it's pretty well. Um, it's a really cool software. 
I would say you probably don't need it until you're looking at like, I have 800 to 1,000 people that I wanna keep in touch with uh, because doing that sort of LinkedIn trick, Facebook newsfeed trick is probably sufficient for a lot of people, but it is a really cool piece of software. Sure, sure. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. So um, let's talk a bit more about how in the in the context of effective networking, our older, less strong friends can be better than our close friends. And I just want to like share that I have a personal example of this, David, if you don't mind. Okay, I want to hear. Uh, so when I st restarted my career in 2009 after having stayed home with kids for eight, nine years, it all started with a weak tie. A guy I knew in junior high whose name spelling I didn't even remember, but I connected with on Facebook. And that one weak tie catapulted itself somehow to the career that I have today. So there's a shout out for the way weak ties can make a huge difference. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it happens often, right? So in, in Friend of a Friend, we tell the story of um, Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. If, if anyone listening is a fan of mixed martial arts and the UFC, you know those names. Most people don't. But I, I will tell you this. They just sold that franchise, fastest growing sport in America, for $4 billion. So, like, there's a business case here, even if you're not a fan of the sport. And the, the only reason they, they even did this is that they were dormant ties. They went to high school together. Dana got kicked out, which is a great way to become a dormant tie. You have to transfer to a different school. And 10 years later, they reconnected at a friend's wedding. And it wasn't just that they were dormant ties and they reconnected. It was, think about the diagram. They were each in different areas of the network. Dana was working as a, as a manager to boxers and mixed martial artists. Lorenzo was, uh, he, he was heir to a casino fortune, so he knew a little bit about hosting events, was connected to the Athletic Commission. So when they finally reconnected, it created the opportunity to leverage both of their communities to create something that grew really, really fast. So it, it happens very, very often. It's specifically because those weak and dormant ties are somewhere else and they can become a potent source of that new information that you need to move forward. Well, and I'm going to go off script for a minute because the thing that occurs to me, David, is that sometimes you'll reconnect with someone um, and maybe there's a mindset that's needed to be able to figure out the possibilities associated with the connection. So do you think there's a specific mindset that we need to bring to, to this idea of networking that can help us be more awake to what's possible? So, I mean, I, I think the, the real thing is I think you need to have a mindset that this is this is needle in a haystack type stuff, right? You're not going to Re, the very first weak tie you ever reach out to is going to turn into that Dana White story or the your story of the 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 uh, friend from school, right? That's that's probably not going to happen right away. But if you're making it a point to constantly be checking in, then it was more likely to happen. But also when you know, like when you know you have a weak tie that's in an industry that you need to make an inroad into, et cetera, it's really awkward if you haven't talked to them for 10 years to start striking up that conversation. So if we make it a regular practice to always be checking in, even if it doesn't manifest in anything important for a while, it's just nice to know what each other are up to and stay friendly with each other, that makes the actual time where they need to ask you for help or you need to ask them for help just one more in a series of conversations. So I think that mentality of just, it's about checking in, there's not an expectation that this is gonna be immediately meaningful is, is the best one. And by the way, I think this applies to everything around networking and connections and community is that coming at it from the standpoint of, I'm interested in connecting with people because that's what being a good human is about and I'm generally interested in love people that's going to be far more beneficial than that mindset of like, I need to connect with more people to help my career. So I'm going to prejudge who's helpful in this room to me and only talk to those people. That might seem like a successful strategy in the short term. It's not in the long term. Well, Sharon, I think that kind of attitude is really evident to people. So um, if you're able to come with no strings attached, connecting for the sake, uh, just for the sake of connecting, um, it's going to be more genuine and and you'll actually be able to get to know people in a deeper way. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So let's talk a little bit about this idea some more, David, that we don't need to focus on growing or creating a network um, as much as we need to be able to leverage the networks that we're already a part of. So mm. what about that person who may, you know feels like they don't have a big network? Do you think that's true for them as well? Um, so how do you balance, you know, creating a network, growing your network with being able to leverage what you've already got. Yeah, and this is actually, um, Audrey, it's a good tangent to sort of our next point, which is if we if we use the, not, sorry, not that point, that was my homework assignment for people, but we already told them the Facebook <laughs> trick instead. My bad. You know, um, tell them so, this homework, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, your homework, if you're watching, is to do this with five friends really, really quickly. 
right? Doesn't take long, just do the newsfeed trick. You can knock it out by the end of the day. Send, see what they're posting about and then send them a message, an invitation, a congratulations, an invitation to talk a bit more often. Um, I bet you can find them by the end of today, if not by the end of this week. Um, but yeah, so Audrey, click forward one more. So this is where this idea of seeing your whole network comes from. So again, if you're sitting there and you're going, well, I don't have a big network. Again, you don't have any network. None of us do. We exist inside of one. And what a lot of us don't have, I think, an appreciation for is how interconnected that network is, right? So to, to tell you a story, right, the, we, we're familiar with this concept sometimes of six degrees of separation or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you've ever played that game, right? And the, uh, the Kevin Bacon thing is, by the way, a total fluke. I won't go into it here because, Becky, I knew you watched a uh, Facebook Live with me talking about it before. It, man, it went overboard. But there really <laughs> are studies dating back to the 1970s that our population, 7.4 billion people strong and counting, is really only six, five to six introductions away from anyone else in the community. Less if you're thinking about your professional network or just your region, your geography, et cetera. We're talking the entire globe, including like people on an island in the South Pacific and people and, and hermits living in New York who never talk to even their neighbors, right? All of them are connected by five or six introductions. Which means if you think about your network, right, it's only one or two introductions away. But most of us are not exploring the fringes of that regularly. So I'm going to give you an idea. So Audrey, click forward one more. So here's sort of a rough diagram of the whole network. You are the red dot, right? When we think about your network, and I don't have that big of a network, we think about that immediate, those five people that we're immediately connected to in black. Right. And so we think, oh, I've got a small network. I only know five people. You probably don't only know five people. You probably know 100 to 200 people. But you still think, oh, that's so small. Right. But now look at how this compounds. Right. You go one introduction out and suddenly you've got more people. You go two out. You've got even more. And this is actually I got tired of drawing circles. So it's actually a far more exponential scale than even this. The key is to be exploring the fringes kind of on a regular basis. So I coach a lot of people to ask the question, who do you know in blank, which is my homework assignment, we'll get to that in a second. But um, I asked that question with blank being whatever industry, whatever sector that you wanna get to know more people in. And I ask it specifically for a reason. You're not asking for a specific name, you're asking for a list of names. You'll usually get a list of names of people that that person is willing to introduce you to should you need to. And that's really, I mean, to be totally honest with you, if everyone were better at reaching back out to weak and dormant ties and asking who do you know in blank and exploring the fringes of your network, that's enough for almost everyone, what your career goals are, what level of influence you have to in your networking. That's, that's more than enough for most people to have a thriving career and have a good life. You don't actually need to ever go to that event, that conference, what have you, unless they're supplementing one of those two activities. That's usually enough. Wow, um, that's interesting. So do you have any examples about that? Of the six degrees, so my, my favorite example actually sounds a bit like yours. So in the in Friend of a Friend, we talk about uh, Michelle McKenna Doyle, who was the, uh, well, I won't tell you what she is yet, um, but she was, she, was a, she was a football fan, actually. She grew up in a family, she was the only daughter in a family of brothers. They played football for the University of Alabama. Dad played football for the University of Alabama. Um, she went to Auburn, which was a bit of a betrayal. But um, she starts her career as an accountant, gradually transitions into working in IT. She's the CIO of companies like Walt Disney World, Universal Studios. She's essentially working for a Fortune 100 energy company that merges with another energy company and basically say, you have a job if you wanna to move to Chicago, but if you don't wanna to move to Chicago, you don't have a job. So she starts saying, all right, well, I need a, a new gig, right? And she is still a football fan, so she's checking her fantasy football league one day. And down at the bottom in career, she clicks on it, she sees this thing that sounds a lot like her skills and abilities, but isn't a CIO position. So you put yourself in her shoes and you're thinking like, okay, I like football, but I have no connections to the NFL. They need a CIO, but they don't need a, they don't know they need a CIO. So I would have to somehow find a strong enough connection to them where I could also convince them that they're not even looking for the right position. They need to elevate their search and look for a C-suite executive and it needs to be me. So she starts working the fringes of her network. She's, she's moving around, she's asking, who do you know in blank? She's finding people. She eventually finds a dormant tie, right? Not unlike yourself, that was a coworker from when she was in Orlando who moved from the resort space to working for an executive search firm. And his firm's not handling the search, but he knows who is. And so he makes the introduction to the firm that is. So we got one dormant tie, 
one degree of separation and now she's being considered by that search firm. She eventually finds herself in the boardroom interviewing, convincing them they need a CIO, right? Convincing them it needs to be her. She gets hired, she becomes the highest paid female executive uh, in the NFL at the time and the only person in her family who made it into the NFL. Oh, that is incredible. I know, what right? an awesome story. It's a it's a really cool story. And and the truth is most of our careers are kind of full of that when these things happen. I just think we can be a bit more intentional and kind of force it by regularly asking these questions. And you're not looking for the introduction when you say, who do you know in blank? You're just looking to get an idea of who is a friend of a friend if I could help them one day or they could help me. That's helpful. So you mentioned something about homework. What's our homework on this one, yeah, Dave? So we click forward one more. It's to really take down this question. Who do you know in blank? Make it a regular habit of it. So you're already going to reach back out to five, you know, dormant ties, five connections. And one of those connections, I want you to ask this question. Who do you know in blank? Blank can be a geography. It can be an industry. It can be a company. It can be anything. Don't have an agenda. You're not asking for an introduction. You, I just want to show you how easily this question comes when you're not trying to be that sleazy person trying to get something out of it right away and how the answer is usually a list of multiple names and how helpful that can be. That's awesome. Thanks, David. So in the book, uh, and I have begun to read it since I went to pick it up on pub day. Also, um, you, my bad for not mailing you a copy way ahead of time. So oh, it's uh, all good. I, I, to a, be I fair, I a friend of a friend, and I'm a bad friend. No, so to be that. fair, I had a PDF copy far in advance. I just, you know, I have old eyes, so it, okay, it's fine. good to have. You're a bad friend. All right. Well, one of us is a bad friend. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in the in the book, you say that the most connected people inside a tight group within a single industry are less valuable than those people who bridge the gaps between groups and broker information back and forth. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, Aubrey, why don't we jump two slides ahead of time and I'll show you something. I'll just go right to the diagram, right? So, every network, a network, you know, all of these images, you've noticed something. They have, they're not egalitarian. They don't look like a piece of graph paper where everyone's connected to each other equally. They are, they have nooks and crannies, they have clusters, right? And, oh, and those clusters are important. They're not, we can't do away with them. They're important for sharing information and, and for trust and bonding. You know that there's, you need, you can't have all friends equally. You need close friends and you also need distant friends, right? So you know that already. What happens over time though, is that sometimes these, cl these clusters can be a bit too much. So if you work in an organization, you know about silos, politics, and turf wars, and you know that to sort of be a bad thing. Um, and they're, they're a good thing for speed of information and for knowledge sharing inside that cluster, but they're a bad thing uh, overall as a whole. And it turns out the people that help mitigate these uh, are the people that provide the most value for the whole network. So in fancy network science terms, we call that gap between two clusters a structural hole. And we call a, a broker is the name for a person that bridges that gap between the two of them. Right. So this can be um, you getting two different divisions in your organization to talk to each other a little bit more because you've been a past member of both. This can be you deliberately saying, well, I'm in this industry, but I need to know more people in this industry. Whatever it is, it creates an information flow that wouldn't have happened without you standing in that gap. And it creates a ton of value both for those two clusters, but also for yourself over time because you're seen as that linchpin between these two communities. Uh, and it turns out that like most of us have this approach when we think of networking that I need to know as many people in the cluster as possible. I need to know my industry in and out. And that may be true, but let's be honest, at a certain point, every new connection becomes redundant. And when that happens in, in your career, in your life, in your organization, or in the industry as a whole over your career, it's time to start thinking about being a broker instead of just getting to know one more ever redundant person. So I'm gonna ask, do you have a story on this one? I do, I have several stories on this one. My, my favorite example, I'll, I'll actually share two really, really quickly if I can. Sure. Um, my, my favorite example is the story of Jane McGonigal. So Jane McGonigal has a brilliant TED Talk. I think it has multiple TED Talks, actually. She's brilliant. Um, but Jane was a video game designer, of all things. And she had even written a book about how, like, video games and gamification can save the world by reinforcing positive habits and that kind of stuff. But then she had to put it into practice. She hit her head and got a concussion. And it was supposed to be this minor thing. Like, she just hit her head on a cupboard. I've done it before. And you know, it hurts for the day and then you get over it, but she didn't get over it. It got worse and worse and suddenly doctors are talking about it being months of recovery. And if you know anyone that's ever had a deep concussion, you know that like mental health becomes a big issue. In fact, she actually gets to the point where she says, 
I'm either gonna kill myself or I'm gonna turn this into a game. And she takes the prescriptions from her doctors and the things that she knows she needs to be doing regularly as part of her recovery, and she makes it into a game. And it helps, and so because it helps, she puts the game online, invites other people in the game design community to sort of try it as well, and it becomes kind of influential. And here's the big key that unlocked a ton of value. Because of that, she starts reaching out to people from the medical community, and starts doing work with researchers in mental health and in medicine, including like University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, doing actual peer-reviewed placebo-controlled studies on does this game help? So she's connected the health community and the game community together to create something that would have never existed unless these two communities were talking to each other and is super powerful. So that's my individual example. I also, in Friend of a Friend, talk about the example of General Stanley McChrystal, who inherited um, the war in Iraq against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And one of the first things he realized was that typical silos, politics, turf war thing that exists in a lot of organizations. And so you have, I mean, not only the branches of government not talking to each other, but then you add the intelligence communities and whatever, they're just people are not sharing information enough. So he engages in this plan where he deliberately rotates the best, the person who's the highest performer, the star player, off of that, of the team that they're on and moves them to somewhere else. So that it's seen as being this liaison between the two teams is an honor, not a thing that we only give to screw ups. And so because of that, it becomes kind of in demand that people pursue these. And, and he's not looking to connect everyone and every team, but his goal is that for every person in his operation, they can think of someone, at least one person, who's also sat on this team elsewhere in the organization. And so because they know that person and they like that person, maybe this other, this other silo is not the enemy. Maybe they're just another friend like that one person. So you don't have to create all of it but you do have to sort of start to deliberately place brokers in place in organizations um, in order to have success. And if you know anything about sort of the history of that, that was really the turning point um, in terms of his mission was when people started talking to each other, when he as a leader decided I need to deliberately start plugging up these structural holes. So an interesting observation is it seems like there's not any type of industry or, or community where being a broker isn't isn't valuable. So you're talking about gaming and you're talking about, you know, medical professionals and then you're talking about the army. So um, this is widely applicable no matter what you do. Um, yeah, is a broker any, something there's clustering, there's a need for uh, the, anywhere there's clusters, there's structural holes, which means there's a need for brokers. So can anyone kind of decide to become a broker or are there certain requirements? Do you think uh, there are certain so, skills? So now, so now we move a bit from the, the science to the art. Um, I would say that anyone can be. It's a question of where you are um, in your career, right? So you, I don't think you can be that person standing on the, the fringes of the industry that you want to be influential in and start screaming, we need to talk to this community. So <laughs> once you're, I, I think for most people, once you are in enough into the cluster where you're trusted, you're a member of that organization. So you going to do that crazy thing isn't going to be dismissed. It's going to be seen as like, oh, all right, we'll give it a shot. We, I trust them. I know them. I tell most people that when you start to feel like every new person you meet in your community or industry is kind of redundant, is not all that helpful. They're a great person, but they're not providing any new information. That's a good signal that you are embedded enough in that cluster. And maybe it's time to start searching out to other ones. Sure, that's helpful. Well, before we move to the next question, is there any homework on this one? Uh, I think there is. Aubrey, show us if there's homework. There we go. All right, so here's the deal. You are, your main homework assignment, five friends, right? Five friends, reach back out to five weak ties, connect with them. During one of them, ask, um, who do you know in blank? For two other ones, I want you to think about, it'd be great if they're two that you could just connect to each other, but for two other friends in that group of five, I want you to think about, who, who, based on what we're saying when we catch up with each other, who can I introduce them to from my community that I know that would be a different cluster for them, but be someone beneficial to talk about? Um, I, would, I can't get it too specific because everybody's gonna be a little bit different, but I'm willing to bet when that conversation comes up and, and people are talking about what they're doing, what they're moving forward, et cetera, you're, if you're generous with this, in the back of your mind, a name or two will float up as you're talking to that person and you'll think they really could benefit from meeting this person. Go make the introduction. Be smart about it. Do the double opt-in intro. So ask the other person that you just thought of for permission first. Um, but try it. Begin to sort of introduce people, especially if they're from two different clusters and you know that they would benefit from connecting with each other and sharing ideas. 
Okay, let's slow down for a minute, David, because I read all your email newsletters, so I know what the double opt-in introduction is. Uh, yeah, I know so. you've talked about a time that you blew it in the past on that, and you've explained what the better and more appropriate approach is, but I'm guessing that many of the people on the call have never been exposed to that. So how about you just take a couple minutes and explain what you mean by the double opt-in Yeah, Yeah, I know we totally can. Okay, so the, the double opt-in introduction. So when we think about the nature of an introduction, you know, Becky meet Aubrey, right? You already know each other, but you know what I mean. Becky meet Aubrey. You two <sighs> benefit from connecting each other, great. Like the problem with that is it's so easy in today's technology world to just fire off an email connecting two people that we do that. And we don't think about how like everybody has a little bit different rules for who they want to be connected to, et cetera. And then the other thing that can happen is we do that and then we leave people with this really vague like, uh, I don't know who's supposed to take action next. So instead of that, we do what I, what I call, and I didn't coin this term, um, I forget who did, uh, but the, the double opt-in introduction, meaning sending an individual message to both parties first to make sure that they're okay connecting. In practice, it's really more like a single opt-in, but I call it double to remind you that you need both peoples, but you'll be, so you'll be in a conversation with someone and you'll realize that like, yeah, they would really benefit from meeting person B, right? They're person A, they benefit from meeting person B. So instead of saying, let me introduce you to person B, just say, let me check with person B and see if it would be cool to get connect, to get you two connected. That way you're lowering the expectation from person A on whether or not there's gonna be an introduction forthcoming. They know if they hear nothing about it in the future, it's because person B didn't opt in. And then you go to person B and you say, hey, here's so-and-so, uh, here's the reason I would love to get you two connected. I think it'd be tremendous you know, for these reasons, et cetera. If they say yes, then you have a shorter time connecting the two of them because you're basically like A meet B, B meet A, I've already talked about both of you. And then what I tend to do is make sure the last thing you say in any introduction is who is going to be taking action next. It's almost always person A in these examples, but it is sort of like, A, would you follow up with some times where you could get together for a phone call? Or A, could you send that document that we were talking about? Whatever it is, you, you basically give, not only did you get people, both people's permission, but then you also, um, give one person the action item so that it's not just this vague email sitting in the inbox for a week waiting to see who replies to it first. Sure, that's really helpful. And I think one of the things you said that I want to highlight is it's it's helpful to tell people why you think they should get together. So otherwise it's kind of awkward like, oh, well, David thinks we should know each other, but I don't know what we're supposed to talk about. <laughs> Every introduction is fundamentally an endorsement. And there needs to be a reason why you're endorsing that person, right? If, if I'm introducing you to someone, I'm, I'm vouching for you, I'm endorsing you. It'd be really weird if I were just endorsing you as like, Becky's a good person, which you are, you're a good person. Like, <laughs> Thank you. There's probably a reason I'm taking the time to, to vouch for you to put my um, social capital with that other person at stake. You know, Becky's a brilliant mind in book marketing. Becky's a brilliant <laughs> mind in organizations, right? She's run more marathons than I can even visualize. Like there's a couple different reasons why I would introduce you to someone. I need to say that up front because I am fundamentally recommending you. And so there has to be a reason why I'm recommending you. Indeed. Um, this is maybe random, but um, not earlier this week i had a call with a, a potential client for our company and when i asked her how she found out about me she mentioned the name of a guy that i don't know <laughs> so i took the step and went to connect with him on linkedin and i said hey thanks so much you're recommending me and we've never met <laughs> so he wrote to me and said oh i heard about you from this person and this person and this other person I'm like how amazing and powerful is that when someone you don't know is going to endorse you that's a that's an amazing friend of a friend connection i wish i would have known about it to write a book about it Oh man, do you have you have examples like that in the book though, right? True, true, but I would have loved to know yours too. <laughs> well, it just happened this week. So, you know, when the new edition comes out, you can put it yeah, in. Yeah, we'll get it in the paperback. So we have one um, more kind of formal question and we're starting to get some questions in from our attendees and I promise we're gonna oh, get cool. to those soon. But we have one more that we wanna cover. So David, um, we discussed this offline that most people assume that having a large and growing network means that we're surrounding ourselves with people with a lot of diverse perspectives. But quite often that is not true. So let's talk about the effect that networks might have on our exposure to, to diverse ideas and, and people and experiences. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I and I call this sort of in the in friend of a friend, I call this the resist homophily idea. Homophily is a two dollar word. Um, it's an SAT it's word. It's a ten dollar word. It's, it's a yeah, there you fifty go. But dollar you word. Kind of like it's the difference between getting a seven fifty and an eight hundred on verbal, right? In the SAT, <laughs> right? It essentially translates to just love of same, right? 
And what we tend to think is that, you know, humans are, um, they, I mean, we already know they cluster around people that are similar to them. They like, I mean, we like talking to people who think like us because clearly they're brilliant, right? <laughs> but, and we tend to think that's a really strong pool and all you have to do is just sort of get over that and the situation takes care of itself. What we actually find, and Aubrey, do me a favor, click two forward. So what we actually find, right, is that this is what the average network looks like because of this clustering effect, right? What happens is pick pick kind of almost any dot except the ones that are connected um, from the black to the red side. And what you see is that clustering kind of naturally leads to a situation where even if you're trying to meet more people, the introductions that you're going to get are very self-similar. Right. So your closest contacts are very similar to you. It stands to reason that if you're only trusting them, not the weak ties, not the dormant ties, not the structural holes, then what's going to happen is you're going to get introduced to um, people that are very self similar to you and more is not going to be better. Right. It's just not going to happen. And there's and there, I mean, there's evidence that we're doing this um, in a variety of capacities. So in the book, we even look into politics and we show that over the last 50 years, people are moving not just to red states or blue states, but are literally moving to counties and neighborhoods that are a little bit more red and a little bit more blue, right? So like one of the big debates right now in politics is gerrymandering and gerrymandering is only half the problem, right? Representatives picking their voters is only half the problem. The other problem is people are clustering to be near other people. So they're making it kind of even harder. So this is a this is this complicated issue, and it's evidence of the fact that if you are just saying I want more, so I'm gonna I need to meet more new people, and you're not deliberate about who you're meeting and where those introductions are coming from, you might actually think that you've got a very diverse set of perspectives, and in actuality, you don't. You don't have as much access to information um, as you think you need. And so this is especially for leaders. This is probably the I think one of the biggest and most influential lessons of the book is that you need to be intentional and deliberate about your network because it's going to affect the information that you get, the decisions that you make. And like, you know, history is full. I mean, I'm thinking even Bay of Pigs and long before that, history is full of information, of examples of leaders not having enough information because they're not trusting a diverse enough set of sources for that information and the whole thing falling apart. So don't be that, but also know that even though you say, I want more diversity in my network, I want to know more people, you can't just trust that more will be more diverse. More is only more diverse if you're intentional about the more diverse. So David, when you were referencing how people are clustering, is that a conscious choice that people are making to surround no, I mean, themselves with people like them? Yeah, no one's no one's looking at like the homeowners association pledge and being like, oh yeah, it's solidly for Bernie. Nobody's saying that. <laughs> Right. But you pick up subtle cues. Right. You have you have some sort of you can pick up a little bit on socioeconomic status. But like if if there's a bunch of sobs in that neighborhood, I can make a pretty good guess about how you voted. Right. And if there's a bunch of F-150s in the neighborhood, I can make a pretty good guess about how you voted. Right. So you you pick up these kind of subtle cues and to the extent that people's ideas around all elements of life um, overlap with their political ideologies, you start to feel comfortable in a certain space. Right. By the way, this is 10 times. This is moving 10 times faster in the online space because we have algorithms that basically say if if so and so clicks like on this, serve them more things like that. And as a result, we get into this echo chamber or sometimes they call it a filter bubble where all of the information is coming through. This is why um, th this is I'm, fundamentally, I think this is one of the reasons it seems like Twitter devolved into a, a universe of people just yelling at each other. They're only yelling when their reality is sort of broken and they realize that, wait, there's this whole other group of people over there that are wrong, right? Because 90% of their interactions are just echo chamber people, right? So we know we need the other side in our life to make better decisions, right? We have to be open to it and not shocked when it comes to us. Sure. Well, I'm going to follow up with a question on this topic from our attendees, and we have lots of them coming in, so thank you. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, Julie is asking what strategies you would recommend, David, for ensuring a diverse network. So, yeah. I mean, you said be intentional, but what exactly does that look like? Yeah, so this actually, let's flip it to the homework, right? So the next homework, it's, it sounds simple. It's just this, audit your network. So the very first thing I would encourage people to do is, is make a list of about let's say 25, two dozen, it could be really anywhere between 12 and, and 25 people that you talk to most recently, most frequently, whatever you wanna use. So look at your past call history on your phone, look at your emails, look at like your meetings, see who you're sitting with, 
So that'd be like column A, and then columns B, C, D, E, et cetera on, what are the things you feel like you wanna analyze the level of diversity? So we can do race, we can do gender, we can do ideology, we can do industry background. Age. Age, we can, <laughs> age is definitely one of them. Um, so we can do all of those things, and now go through and essentially fill out the column. Where do they stand on this issue? Where do they stand on that? What you're probably gonna find is that for 25 people, 15 to 20 of them are really self-similar to you, right? And again, it's okay to have some friends that are close to you, et cetera, but what, uh, what I wanna show from the audit is that those other five to 10 people that are very different and diverse from you, you need to now, moving forward, spend a disproportionate amount of time listening to those people. You've just identified who they are already in your network, so now you wanna spend more time with them, listening to them. You also wanna be more open to getting introductions from them, even you know, asking them for introductions from them because those are gonna be the introductions that are not self-similar. So most of us already have, I mean, it's 2018. If I can't convince you that you need at least some people in your network who are different than you, I give up, right? <laughs> like I, this is, That's a losing battle at this point. Most of us know we need that. We just have never taken the time to audit and realize how few people in our network there are in that capacity. And we need to be more deliberate about making time to talk to those people. Yeah, that's super helpful. Uh, so I'm gonna dive into some of these questions from our attendees. Um, and I'm gonna start with this one from Sandy. So she's wondering how you deal with people who wanna connect on LinkedIn, but you've never met or worked with them. And she doesn't usually connect under those circumstances. Is she missing out? No, I know, I mean, it's fine. I, I, the big thing I think is that everyone needs to have rules for how they use each tool, right? And I like to think of them as concentric circles. So for me, um, I have, I've, I've used three social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and that's it. Um, I had Instagram for a time, but all it did was make me want to eat amazing food and go on vacations to places I can't afford to go. So I, I niched that. Um, but Facebook, <laughs> LinkedIn, and Twitter, and I look at them as concentric circles. So Facebook is the closest. My rule for that is actually, I have to have met you in person or I have to be comfortable with you looking at pictures of my kids. And if you don't satisfy both qualities, I'll say no to your friend request and I won't send you one. There is a very small list. It has five people on it of people who I'm friends with on Facebook that don't meet both of those. Becky, you're actually one of them. Um, I know, <laughs> right? Right? So, but but it's a it's a very hard fast rule. My so next concentric circle out is LinkedIn. My rule for LinkedIn, and it can be different for your rule, is if you want to send me a request, like great, I'll say yes to it, and I'll send requests to people that that I'm sort of interested in. Um, and then as soon as you spam me, I'll block you, and we'll move on, and we'll be done. Right. So like, but it's fine. It's an open to me. I have a more open network approach on that. And then the final one is Twitter. And the, the fundamental reason for this is that Twitter, I can't I mean, I can kind of block people, but it gets really difficult. It's a very public forum. Anybody who wants to follow it can follow it. It also means that I don't have to follow them back. So I look at them as concentric circles. Your rule for you is, is fine. I would just say be able to have a hard, fast rule about what your metric is and stick to it. And that way you won't have this dilemma every single time of like, oh, do I say yes? Do I say no? Just say like, if it's we have to have worked together in the past, great. Um, I have a buddy that has a little bit more open rule on LinkedIn. His rule is um, if I would uh, feel comfortable recommending you to someone, then I'll say yes. I don't have to have met you if I'm familiar with your work and, I, and I, I'm proud of it. Like your friend, Becky, that was actually recommending you to someone else. You reached mm -hmm. out to them on LinkedIn, that sort of follows that rule. So whatever your rule is, great. The, the flip side of that is know that other people have certain rules too. And so don't be offended if you send out a connection because that person meets your rule and they reject you because they have a different rule. Just go, hey, everybody's got different rules. I wish, I really actually wish that each network would basically say, here are the community rules, but I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. Well, and LinkedIn does pop up and say, oh, you should only accept people you know well and who know you well. They do tell you that, um, but I have a much freer view on LinkedIn. So if you're on the yeah, call no, today agree, and you wanna connect on LinkedIn, you can go ahead and connect with me there. Right, but other people have the approach of like, this is a tool for keeping track of my professional history, my weak ties of former, and, that, and that's fine too. The big thing is just have, figure out what rule makes you most comfortable and then stick to it so that it's not a question of, oh, do I do it, do I not? It's just a simple, I run it by the checklist. If they meet the checklist, great. Got it. So um, Colleen wants to know, David, how much time um, should we devote to networking? And that's a pretty broad question, depending upon what you're trying to achieve in your life. So um, yeah. maybe give it a try. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, 
It's probably less than you think. I'll start with that. Like most people, when they think about this, they go, oh, I already have so much to do and it's gonna take hours. If what we're doing is a regular habit of reaching back out to one or two weak ties a week, right? And to um, to asking who you know in blank one or two times, a week, we're talking about like an extra 17 minutes, right? Maybe in your work week. Maybe let's go to an hour because you're gonna then have a phone call with one of those weak ties and that's gonna take 30 minutes. Okay, but that's not, a lot of time you probably spend you probably waste more time like being on a, a website reading the news you're not supposed to be on because you're supposed to be working or whatever right or 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 attending a webinar that's business related but come on right <laughs> right i feel bad saying that but you know what i mean like we you can carve out that time um the bigger thing i think a lot of people look at is like that person that's always going to the conferences they're always going to the mixers what have you you don't want to do that that's fine what i will say is we use this term social capital in network science to refer to the value in a network and the value that you've accumulated in that network. And capital sort of always follow that, it follows that investment principle, right? So you can put a ton of money in and then you'll have a lot of money or you can put a little bit of money in over time and watch it compound. The two things that are gonna affect it is how fast you accumulate capital, right? Because the longer you give yourself, uh, the more compound interest comes into play and how much you can invest at a given time. If I had to pick one of the two, I would pick time over time because of the way compound interest works. And I think networking is the same way. So you don't have to feel like, oh, I need to spend 10 hours a week or I need to always be going to those conferences. You make it a regular habit, even if you only have 17 minutes and you commit to that for the next three or four years, you'll see a compounding that other people are not experiencing, even if they're jumping in, doing all the stuff, then burning out and stopping doing it five or six months later, which is I think what most people, where most people are, they heard networking was important, they jumped into it, they burned out of it, and now they're like, I don't wanna do that again. Just do the little thing, but do it consistently over time. Sure, and um, Colleen, if you wanna follow up with any um, other questions, I, I'm curious about uh, that person who, um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm just thinking about you said don't wait until you need a job really basically to start networking. That's the worst time to do it. So the best time to do it is when you don't need anything, right? The, actually, I would say the best time to do it is when you're especially having those phone calls with the attitude of I'm going to try and help other people, right? Second best is when you don't have any agenda whatsoever. And then, you know, the worst would be when it's obvious that you need something and you're that person. I mean, like humans can smell you coming. That person that's <laughs> only coming back out because you're desperate or whatever, we can smell that on you and it does not smell pleasant. Uh, that's a good quote from, from this. Uh, so here's a question. That's going to show up on Twitter in like 20 minutes. It, I'm it's going to, if I can I'm remember watching, it. Aubrey's, Aubrey's posting quotes already for that, so that one's going to show up. For sure. So how often do you clear out your networks, David? Because you mentioned, you know, you pared down your Facebook to only people you actually know in person plus five, and I'm one of them. So <laughs> pat myself on the back. Actually, I will tell you this. It was actually 10. And then in the last five months, I've made a deliberate effort to meet five of them. And so if I show up in Lambertville, Michigan sometime, by the way, it's because you're the only one left on the list and the opportunity hasn't happened yet. So I'm just going to fly there or whatever. Wow. Very cool. I anyway, hope that your actual question happens. Was more about pruning and that kind of a thing, right? Exactly. How often do you clear out your networks? So I, ha I have to be careful here. Never, but that's but but with two caveats, right? The one being there are definitely people in your life who are toxic, who are abusive, who you don't need, and be fast to get rid of those people in your life. Like you have you have no obligation, even even family. You have no obligation if they're emotionally abusive to you or anything like that to stay in touch with them just because they're family. You don't. Get rid of those people, right? So that's caveat one. Caveat two is that if we think about strong ties, weak ties, dormant ties, then the, the correlation of strength of a relationship is interval of time between when we're communicating with them. And so I don't cut people off entirely. I just kind of stretch out the intervals of time in which I feel comfortable interacting with them. Right. And this is usually I mean, for, for a lot of us, we might not get to this point. For me, it was a sort of a survival mechanism. Right. Um, the specific friends per friends on Facebook purge that you referred to that that happened last December just because I realized I want to enforce these rules. Here's what I came up with that I'm comfortable with. So, I mean, you could start there for sure. But again, I didn't unfriend any of those people. I just stretched out the interval of time. Some of them, it's like, we went to high school together and I'll see you at the regular reunions. And that's good enough for me. And if it's not good enough for you, 
phone works both ways. You're welcome to reach out to me, right? I'm not cutting these people off in my life. I'm just saying, here's the interval of time in which I want to make sure I reach out to them. And some people, it's a different interval than others. And that's kind of correlates to the strength of relationship. Sure, that makes sense. And a follow up from Colleen, who asked the question about how much time to spend networking. Uh, she s says that she's trying to um, get out of her comfort zone and convince herself that starting small will make a difference. And I think resounding, the answer is yes. Um, a little bit of time over a long period of time can be valuable to you. Absolutely. And and not only not only starting small with a little bit of time, but also start with your week in dormant ties. Like do I promise you, do the, the Facebook hack, the LinkedIn hack, find a thing that someone you know but haven't talked to in a while is broadcasting and then use that as the reason. It's far more comfortable than doing that blank, like, hey, this guy Dave Burke has said I'm supposed to email weak ties, so I'm emailing you. Like if you find that real reason, it's an authentic kind of real reason. It's it's gonna feel natural. So start there, wait till that's regularly comfortable, wait till you've grown your comfort zone inside of that, and then go to the next thing, and then go to the next thing. Sure, that's helpful. Um, I wanna talk for a minute again about the in-person networking events, um, because I've lived here in Lambertville, Michigan for, I don't know, eight years now, and the number of times I've gone out to something in person to meet people face-to-face -face is very tiny. I don't wanna tell you how many. Um, and so I'm curious, David, in your life and career and in the research you did for the book, you know, how valuable is that face-to-face -face connection compared to a virtual or some other means of connecting? Okay, there's a couple things to unpack here. Um, the, the first is that uh, most of the research suggests that online tools are useful to the extent that they're a supplement to, not a replacement for your offline network, right? So, um, I, you know, it's, it's useful to be a member of these different groups online, et cetera, but you're gonna have a stronger relationship with that person if you make the effort to meet them um, in person. Right. So that's sort of part one. Part two is you brought up like the networking mixer, the thing that everyone hates and thinks that's what we mean when we say networking. Most of the research supports they're really not good. Like there's just not the, the lack of structure to the event. And I'm talking specifically about these sort of speed dating for professionals meetups. I'm not talking about the cocktail hour at the trade association conference. Right. Or, or something like that. That's a different scenario. But these things where there's lack of structure and the whole point is just meet new people. We don't actually meet new people. Now, most people spend uh, more time with people, the, the few people they already know than they don't know, which tells us that these events are better for reconnecting with weak and dormant ties than they are for meeting new people, right? So where I see sort of the role of online is it's great for that beginning step of the relationship. You're both in the same industry group, right? Or you both are in the same tweet chat or whatever it is. And now I'm going to make an effort to go meet you in person next time there's an event. So I, I'm i similar. Tulsa is a little bit bigger city than Lambertville. I mean, you're near Toledo, which is a big, a big. There's lots city, of right? stuff in Toledo, yes. Right, but we both live we both live in cities of like eh, around a million people, not 11 million like New York City, right? So both of us have to kind of do this. And one of the things that I do is I'm in, I'm very intentional when I do travel. And I also like to say I can afford to travel more often because I live in a low cost of living city. But that's a whole other monologue. Um, when I do travel, right, I make it a point to even stage these events sometimes, not to meet new people, but to reconnect with those weak and dormant ties in person to meet. I mean, I just I was in New York two weeks ago and I added five Facebook friends because I had five people that I knew from certain community didn't know in person. Right. Then said, hey, let's all get together for dinner this night and met those people. And now they're sort of now they're in the offline world as well. I think that's kind of the goal is it's the introduction, it's the beginning stages, but unless you're moving towards sort of getting to know them in person, there are very few exceptions to the rule that they can be sort of deep and, and meaningful connections. You, by the way, are one of those exceptions to the rule. But, um, for most that of us. So kind. <laughs> Thanks, David. Well, let's take a quick moment. I promised at the beginning of the call that we were going to share some very special bonuses connected to the launch of your new book. So, Aubrey, if we can see the slide about that. Okay, so um, here's the book. Uh, if you buy the book today and you forward your receipt to pre-order at davidberkus.com, you're going to get these four bonuses plus one we just added today. So, yeah, you're going to get like two minutes before we started. You're going to get access to this How to Connect podcast series, which will be more content to help you as you're on this journey of networking and figuring out how to uh, leverage your network. You're going to get the Friend of a Friend workbook. 
you're going to get a VIP pass to the Super Connector Summit, and you're going to get an autographed book plate, which means that David's going to actually sign a sticker that he's going to send to you, and then you're going to get to put it in your book so that you can have a signed book. Or if you have a Kindle, we're waiting for somebody to put the sticker on the back of their iPhone or on I the back of their iPad. I would love to see that. I really would. Let me, um, let me so, take a second and talk about these kind of briefly, right? So, sure, so that'd be great. Connect, the How to Connect podcast series is um, it's an audio course. It's a, it's a collection of audio from me that is basically how to put a lot of these ideas into practice. The double opt-in introduction is in there, right? I also have sort of a guest um, interview with a friend of mine, Clay Hebert, who is a brilliant person in thinking about how do you properly introduce yourself to people. Um, that's all in there. It's, it's, uh, it's based on the ideas in front of a friend, but it's the how to, especially the Clay Hebert thing is, unique to that series, right? The friend of a friend workbook, so I already gave you homework on this webinar, there's homework in the book. What there's not in the book are worksheets. The worksheets to help you do the homework are in the workbook, right? The Super Connector Summit was this awesome thing we did last year where I interviewed like 65 plus people who were great at either being networkers or building communities or just connecting people in general. So we'll give you the top 10 most watched interviews from that. And then yes, we'll send you the book plate, you can slap it in your book, and or slap it on your Kindle, slap it on your phone, slap it on your forehead, wherever you put it, take a picture and send me, I just wanna see. Um, but it's just a way, one of the weird things about 2018 is technology makes it easier to reach lots of people, but it makes it harder to be able to say like, hey, thank you for being a friend, purchase this book, et cetera. So it's my way of being able to do that. I'm handling all the postage, including international postage. I've got a bunch of those international stamps uh, to send nice. you to, so yeah. So grab that, really simple, just forward your receipt once you get it from wherever you order it to pre-order at davidbergis.com and we'll take care of the rest. Oh. And the awesome extra bonus is that next week, we haven't picked the day yet, David and I are gonna get everyone together who bought the book through the pre-order and through the launch phase. And we're gonna have a party on Zoom. You can come on camera if you want. You can talk to David face to face. And that's only going to be for people who have bought the book and forwarded the receipt uh, to David. Now, if you happen to do what I did and go to Barnes and Noble to buy the book, you can just snap a picture of your receipt and you can email that over as well. You don't have to buy it online. You can go old or school. Or you can like just snap a picture of the book in your hand. We'll, we'll trust you. We'll believe that you got it, right? So, yeah. <laughs> and um, Greg is wondering if we can get the book in Canada. Uh, yes. You know? Okay. Yeah, it's available in Canada. Uh, enough copies haven't floated their way up, so the exchange rate is a little weird. If you want to just grab the Kindle one because it's cheaper, like that might be easier, and we'll still honor it, all of that. Um, the, I, the cover is so awesome. You're going to want the hard copy, but um, you really are. I, I, bought, to, I bought two. I have nothing to do with the cover, so I can brag about it. Um, but yeah, it really it's awesome. definitely available in Canada. If it's if it is not like if you're tuning in from like Australia, by the way, I know right now it's not available. When it is and you grab it, send me an email and we can get you all of this stuff. We can't get you on the webinar because I don't have the time stone from Avengers. Um, so I can't do that, but I can get you everything else too. So if it's not available where you're at, once it is, let me know and, and we'll get you everything. So there are four amazing bonuses on this slide. The fifth bonus is an after party with David and me, and we're tons of fun, as you already know, and uh, it's gonna be great. We're gonna find a time, and we hope you'll be there next week with us. So David, thank you so much for joining me today. This was an awesome conversation. I learned a lot. Um, I'm excited to finish the book and learn even more and I'm excited for next week and um, for those of you who invested time with us we appreciate it deeply and we look forward to seeing you in the future Thanks, yeah David. no and thank you all so much for having me thanks for being a part of this for sending questions if we didn't answer it hit us up on Twitter or email or whatever more importantly I mean grab the book join us in the after party and you can ask it in person so let's do that too but yeah let's keep this conversation going I think it's too important not to all right thanks bye everyone